Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, just one request. I'm very sorry for the inconvenience. Can you just uh, request the speakers whom you sent the invite like to join again, like uh, the speakers? Like, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I, I mean, uh, where do you just uh, you know like send? Did you just send the invitations to other people who will be joining tonight? So uh, can you just ask them to request access once more so that I mean. Uh, it, it is created, uh, you know, like through the ID of uh, SAC, so Students Affairs Council. So uh, Ishika is here from the end, so she can give access to them also. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I think they have joined, and I think some of them are uh, are, are watching through the Facebook. I uh, sorry, the the YouTube. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Yeah, fine then. Okay. Just give me a second, huh? Just give me a second. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. We will uh, wait for just a few minutes, like a couple of minutes or so, and then we can we can start. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, yeah, just a second. <coughs> Okay, so I guess uh, many of us are here. So a very good evening and greetings of the day. A very warm-hearted welcome to the second episode of the Nobel Talk series conducted by the Science Club of Pfizer Kolkata. We have witnessed in the very first episode itself, like some of our esteemed faculties will discuss the research areas of the Nobel laureates of this year. And today's host will be Shubhaji Chak.
in the research areas of the Nobel laureates of 2021. So for today, our honorable speaker is Dr. Arnob Gupta. Dr. Gupta completed his PhD in 2006-7 from CSIR Indian National Institute of Chemical Biology in the field of human genetics under the supervision of Professor Kunal Roy. Subsequently, he moved to US for his postdoctoral training with Professor Svetlana Lutsenko and Anne Hubbard at the John Hopkins University. His field of study was to elucidate the regulations of the human copper pumps and channels. After a brief stint at the University of Calcutta as a Ramanujan fellow, he set up his independent research group at Isar Kolkata. Presently, at Isar Kolkata, using various cutting edge techniques, especially high resolution imaging and molecular dynamic studies, his group is probing the secretory pathway that the copper ATPase, ATP7A, and ATP7B traverses to export copper from the cell. Dr. Gupta is an eminent researcher hailing from the Department of Biological Sciences in the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Kolkata. His research work focuses primarily on cell biology, membrane trafficking, eukaryotic copper metabolism. So this episode uh, of the Nobel talk series will be focused on the topic which led Dr. Arden Patapushian and Dr. David Julius to the roadway to the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine 2021. And it is the discovery of receptors for temperature and touch. Before that, let's have a glimpse of the research background of the Nobel laureates and also their field of work. Dr. Arden is an American molecular biologist, neuroscientist whose work is primarily focused on the characterization of PIEZ01, PIEZ02, and TRPM8 receptors that detect pressure, menthol, and temperature. He was awarded the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine jointly with Dr. David Julius for their enlightening and groundbreaking work in the receptor systems, in particular, the discovery of receptors for temperature and touch. Dr. David Julius is an American physiologist known for his work on the molecular mechanisms of pain, sensation, and heat, and also for the characterizations of special receptors like TRPD1 and TRPM8. David Julius utilized capsaicin, a pungent compound from chili papers to indu that induces a burning sensation, and Arden Petaputian use pressure-sensitive cells to discover a novel class of sensors that respond to mechanical stimuli in the skin and internal organs. These breakthrough discoveries launched intense research activities leading to a rapid increase in our understanding of how our nervous system senses heat, cold, and mechanical stimuli. The laureates identified critical missing links in our understanding of the complex interplay between our senses and the environment. Before we start, we would like to mention that you may post your questions and doubt in the chat box and the audience who are watching the YouTube live can also post their questions in the live chat. Hoping for a spectacular interaction with all. And now we would like to hand it over to today's honorable speaker, Dr. Anup Gupta. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes, sir. You're completely okay. audible. Thank you. Great. I, I'd like you uh, to request you to just wait a few seconds. The recording is getting started. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Once the red signal is on, you can you can go on. Yeah. Sure, sure. I can see that. Yeah. The recording is getting started. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, I would like to take uh, this opportunity. Uh, to thank the science club, uh, Shubhojit and the organizers, because I think it's a great effort uh, to popularize science among young graduate students, young students at ISER. Uh, and we'll try our best to uh, make it work from our side as well. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, without further ado, I will uh, put up the slides and let me know if they are visible or not. I will try turn off my camera. Uh, 
and I will put on the slides. So Shubhajit, can you see the slide? Or yes, sir. Anybody? It's perfectly visible. Okay. And is it is it in full screen? Uh, no, sir. I guess. I just no. put it in full screen. I don't know. Uh, one second. How about now? Not yet. Uh, no, sir. Not yet. Shantan, can you once just confirm if you can see it on full screen or not? Uh, no, actually, I guess uh, you have to uh, present it in uh, the full screen mode. So, uh, sir, I would request you to go to that, uh, you know, like that Jimmy thing and just present uh, uh, the full screen instead of the window. I guess you are uh, currently on a window. So, yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me do it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Is it in full screen now? Yes, sir. Now it's in. Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, good. And let me just turn yeah, on the, the laser pointer. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here on a late uh, Sunday evening. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to start with uh, a few uh, interesting paintings of the post-Renaissance and the pre-Renaissance era. And they have a common theme. Okay, and you will see how they are law all linked to for today's talk today. Okay, so this one, the first one is is a part of a, uh, a famous painting by Michelangelo, and this is the creation of Adam, where I can see the the hand of God, which is on the right, is touching uh, the hand of Adam, which he just whom he just created. Okay, so just just oops, remember the term I, I use the term touching. Okay. In the next image, the next photo uh, on the left is, is a famous uh, painting by Edvard Munch, the Norwegian pre-Renaissance painter, where he depicts a physical pain in the painting called Scream. On the right, uh, it's uh, by Rubens, uh, 1612, Prometheus Bound, where uh, Prometheus, a titan, is being punished by God for bringing in light or stealing light and fire from heaven. And bringing it to to the earth, uh, to giving it to to the mankind. Okay, so he is punished in a way. Uh, an, an eagle is tearing up his abdomen and eating his liver. And as soon as that act is completed, uh, his liver regenerates. And again, this act is repeated, where the eagle comes again and tears off his abdomen and eats his eats his liver. So this keeps on going, and this is one of the best examples of physical suffering. The third one is a famous, a very famous painting, uh, Guernica by Picasso, where he uh, depicts the, the, the suffering, uh, the physical suffering, which is elicited by war. Uh, in 1937, the, the small town of Guernica in Spain was completely shattered by German bombing, and people died by various ways, by disembowelment of bodies, by burning, so it was a it was a very uh, sad but a holistic view of physical pain. Okay, so if I may ask you now, what is the common thread that that joins these four paintings? You can think for a while, and I'm sure you will answer that pain, physical pain, and the touch from the first one they form a common theme for these paintings, isn't it? So it's it's very evident that for for many years, for for thousands of years, for centuries, the mankind has been very interested in understanding the physical nature, the biological nature of pain. 
but over the last 30 years or so it it has they have started to appreciate the molecular biology or the physiology of pain how pain uh, or how touch is perceived by humans or by by animals it can be uh, pain because of some something hitting you or because of uh, something cutting you or even because of fire or heat or too cold okay so that brings us to today's uh, title of my talk uh, is the touchy feely aspects of human perception and the five photos that i've shown over here a cactus being uh, a, a, a pricking a finger a fire uh, the 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 feeling of cold uh, by touching the ice and there's some chili papers as well and uh, three leaf uh, leaves of mint so i can i can promise you they look a bit bit strange and uh, disconnected but at the end of the talk you can appreciate that they are all connected very closely so let's talk about the touchy feely aspects of human perception uh, well uh, if if i just talk about uh, this year's nobel prize as as shubhajit uh, mentioned that it went to adem pataputian and uh, david julius so i will i will be doing a, a, a disservice to the long line of research that has been conducted for many centuries to understand the biology of touch so in the early 16th century uh, the famous french philosopher rene descartes he was the first to hypothesize that uh, there are receptors well he didn't use the term receptor he said that there are things on the skin of man which can sense change of temperature or pain or physical pressure and there are things which carries this message he used the term message which carries this thing this message from the skin to the, our head and this probably goes through the back of our body so and and uh, rene descartes being a very smart and one of the most brilliant minds of the last 1000 years he was absolutely right although it was a hypothesis he have used the term things and uh, possible head and possibly it passes through the back of our body but uh, he was absolutely right because we now know that the things that 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 receive the pain or sense the temperature are called receptors and the things that carry this message from the skin to the back of our body is called the nerve and the thing at the back is the spinal cord which is a part of the central nervous system and finally when it reaches the brain it is the part one of the most important part of our body so rene descartes was completely absolutely right in hypothesizing that this is how uh, possibly our uh, sensation of touch is being felt is being perceived and carried on to the brain and <clears throat> fast forward 300 years uh, actually 400 years possibly uh, 1944 the two young students uh, joseph alanger and herbert gasser both were doctors and were trained at Johns Hopkins University, and I, I feel a bit uh, a sense of pride because I was uh, I I did spend six years, uh, just over six years, as at the same department uh, at Johns Hopkins. So they studied medicine over there, and they were the first. Erlanger and Spencer Gasser were the first uh, to explain that there are sensory nerves that can differentiate between different type of pain or different type of touch and there are different regions in the brain which are responsible for the perception of this pain because of a physical stress or uh, by pressure or because of cut or because of change of temperature and they did win the nobel prize in 1944 in physiology and medicine for their discoveries relating to the highly differentiated functions of single nerve fibers so I will, I will not use uh, too much jargons because I, I completely appreciate that in the audience there will be uh, students and and uh, my my colleagues who are not from biology background. So I'll try to keep it as 
simple and as lucid as possible. So have a look at the right picture. I'm moving my cursor. So this is the, the receptor, or it's a protein molecule. I'll be talking about it a little mo uh, more in the, in the next slide. So let us think these are some big protein molecules which are sitting on the membrane of our skin. And these are called nociceptors. Noci means pain, and these are the pain receptors. So when they receive the pain, when they are, are inflicted by some pain, they carry the pain, they sense the pain and carry it, the, uh, the, it, it via chemical messengers by the nerves, which is called the afferent nerve fiber. And these are sensory nerves. And that's it. This is the end of the peripheral nervous system. Then it reaches what we call the central nervous system. And the central nervous system, the part of the central nervous system, which is responsible to transmit it to the brain is called the, the spinal cord. And this is a cross section of the spinal cord and the message climbs up through the central nervous system, your spinal cord. And finally, it reaches the thalamic region of the brain. So I will not, uh, I'm not going to discuss what is the thalamic region or what is the cortex of the brain, but just remember that these are the specialized regions of the brain, the mysterious brain, which can tell you, well, this is a cold touch, or this is a hot touch, or this is, I feel pain because I just uh, snapped my finger with a blade, or this is a pain where you have pricked me with a needle. Okay, so the regions of the brain or the sub-regions of the thalamic region decides how to label the pain. Is it a heat pain or a cold pain or a cut pain or what, what type of pain? But make sure none of these are mental pain. These are all physical pains. Okay, and <clears throat> this year's Nobel Prize, if I may, this is the region which has been concentrated, which these two scientists, David Julius and Adam Pataputian, they have been concentrating on identifying what are these receptors, the nosy receptors that we call. Okay, so on the left is the nerve ending. Okay, and on the nerve ending, you have different type of receptors, or you may also call them channels. So I'll just name a few of them. It's written over there, P2, uh, P2X3, two uh, trip V1, uh, AI, ASIC, piezo. Piezo means pressure. Okay, piezo means pressure in uh, uh, Latin. So there are different type of receptors sitting over here. Uh, for example, the trip receptor, trip V1, is responsible to send the message of heat. Piso is responsible to send the message of pressure. Okay, and this is the nerve ending, and they send the message through the through the nerve, and as I told you, it finally ends up in the thalamic region of the brain. Right. <clears throat> now, the question is, I just mentioned these are receptors or and then I just mentioned these are channels. But I think we should we should know in a little bit more about what are, what are channels. I mean, what do I mean by channels and why do they sit on membranes? OK, uh, I take a little bit of pride to present one of my uh, lab data, which was generated by uh, my very talented uh, graduate student, Shumanto. Many of you might know him. Uh, so he is in my lab and he works on copper ion channel. Okay, so I work on ion channels, but the ion which I work on is not calcium or sodium or potassium, but it's copper. So in this cell, uh, in this image, this is a confocal uh, microscopy image uh, where uh, the red uh, stain uh, stains the, uh, the cell membrane. And the green one, the green fluorescent, it depicts the ion channel in this case, the copper ion channel, which is sitting on the membrane. Okay, and what it does, it, it imports copper. Okay, similarly, these pain receptors, they import calcium, potassium, or sodium. Okay, depending upon what type of pain, what type of receptor, they usually vary between the, uh, they usually import uh, one of these three type of uh, ions, or it can be more than one but it has to be calcium, uh, potassium, or sodium. Okay, so this is on the right is a very uh, pictographic illustration of the cell membrane. You have the lipid bilayer, which is made of uh, fats, 
And on this fat, you have the proteins sitting, and this is one ion channel, if I may. And this ion channels, they can have two conformations. They can have an open conformation where it, it allows the ion to pass through and enter the cell, or it can have a closed conformation where the, it doesn't allow it to, it, it, it to pass. Okay, now what happens when it allows calcium ion to enter? How does it help transmission of nerve signal or the transmission of the pain signal or the heat signal? So what it does, this calcium is important to release neurotransmitters. Say, for example, you must have heard serotonin. Okay, so serotonin can only be released in the nerve and it can only carry uh, itself to the brain with the help of calcium. So I will not go into the detailed mechanism of how it works, but just let me tell you, this calcium which is entering the cell allows the neurotransmitters to be released and they can climb up the, the spinal cord, okay, from one neuron to the next neuron, and finally they end up in the thalamic region of the brain and say as well, I'm in pain. Okay, so that's why ion channels are the first gateway of reception of pain reception or touch reception. That's why so they are very important. Okay, so uh, this is uh, David Julius. He is a professor at Uni University of California, San Francisco, and he is uh, uh, Ardem Pataputian. And I, I, I intentionally put this picture of Ardem uh, because many of my uh, faculty colleagues or even students will appreciate uh, and can guess that this picture was taken absolutely during the lockdown. Right, because uh, the attire that we uh, we uh, use while we for, for lectures or presentations or meeting, usually it's very sober on the top, but you're never sure what's at the bottom. It could be a Bermuda or it could be a half pant or pajama. Okay, so Adam Putin looks very happy because this was after he won uh, the the Mark Award just just uh, six months before the Nobel Prize, and he was giving a talk. Okay. And it was absolutely during the lockdown. So Adem Patiputian is, uh, uh, is, is an Armenian by origin. He is from Lebanon. And he is a professor at Scripps Institute. And he comes from, he is from a very educated family. His father is a poet. OK, so now the question is, uh, what made him start this research? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, the touch receptor, the, the pain receptor. And then I'll move on to the heat receptors. So I'm going to tell you a very, a very interesting short story that ignited or triggered the research area of Ardem. So back in 2010, where Ardem has started his career and he was an associate professor, and he was uh, still thinking about how to decipher uh, or how to find the, the receptor which is important for pressure, which can sense pressure or pain. Okay, so he got a phone call from one of his collaborators uh, who worked at the University of Toronto uh, Medical College, so from Canada. So this doctor, his name is uh, uh, his name is Charles Bonnerman. So Charles Bonnerman uh, recently saw a patient, an uh, eleven-year-old girl, who had a very strange disease. So this girl was unable to move her limbs. So in the morning, she's unable to get up from the bed. She is unable to wear her slippers, and she is unable to brush her teeth, or she, she is unable to even take, uh, uh, take a glass of water and drink it. So she is incapable of carrying out any limbic movement. OK, but interestingly, you know, that, that can happen. But interestingly, these are all the activities that I mentioned we usually do in a non-conscious manner. I will not use the use, use the term unconscious, but non-conscious manner. So when you wake up in the morning, do you think that, well, it's time now I will put my feet on ground, or well, this is the time I should wear my chappals and I should walk to the bathroom, or should I, uh, this, I have decided to uh, take the toothbrush and brush my teeth. You don't do that, right? It's somehow, you, you know that you will be doing it. Okay, so it's, it's, you, you sort of take a very, involuntary approach of doing these things. But this girl cannot do any of this. Interestingly, 
she can only do it if she watches herself doing this. Interesting, isn't it? If she watches, if she sees her legs, okay, if she visualizes her legs, if she sees it, and then only she can put her leg on the ground, and she has to constantly watch her leg moving, stepping, so that she can reach the, the toothpaste or the toothbrush, and she has to watch her hands picking up the toothpaste and brushing the teeth. So that means all her limbic movement is under the control of a visual cue. Okay, so this doctor, Charles Bonaman, he uh, flew immediately, he flew to US and contacted his collaborator, Adem Potiputian. He was uh, at Scripps at that time. Uh, and Adem thought, well, this might be a very interesting case. So this is a case of proprioception, which has gone wrong. So proprioception is just like nociception. Nociception is feeling of pain. Proprioception is filling your limbs. Okay, and proprioception is usually carried on in a non-conscious fashion. But if not, if something is wrong with these pressure receptors, proprioception comes under the control of visual cue. That means you have to dictate your hand by your eyes that will pick up that glass and drink the water. Okay, so this is where the interest for uh, the hunt for uh, uh, pressure receptors or proprioceptors in parallel to nociceptors started in Adem Potiputian's lab. Am I clearly audible to everybody? Hey, yes, sir, you're completely audible. Okay, good, good. Yeah, I do yeah. this once, once in a while in my class as well. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, so now, how how would he how is he going to discover the 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 gene or the protein which is responsible for proprioception or nociception? He has been hunting for this for a long time now, but he hasn't a clue till now. Okay, so now is the time for him to find the protein or the uh, or the cell or, or the gene which is responsible for that as a touch receptor, as as it is said in in English. Colloquia, uh, philosophically, they, are, they will only value your presence when they feel your absence, right? So this is exactly how we value or we understand the importance of a gene by making it absent. So what we do, we knock it out. Okay. So what what he did and what it is it is done in in regularly in. Uh, in the labs of cell biologists and molecular biologists, and I also do that, we knock down cells, uh, sorry, we knock down genes by using techniques called homologous recombination. I'm not going to go into that, going to that. Once you knock a single gene, you measure the phenotype or the expression or how, what happens to the cell. Okay, and then if you see that there is no effect on the cell, you discard it. You, sell, you say that, well, this gene is not responsible for mechanical stress reception. Then you knock down a second gene. And then you do the third gene. And then you go for the fourth gene. And finally, if you're lucky, you will ultimately, eventually, you find a gene. If you knock it out, there will be problems of stress response in the cell. Okay, and I can tell you, this is a very arduous process. This is not simple as I just mentioned in, in two minutes. So I have done it in my lab. One of my students is really working hard for last one year. And finally, he thinks he has a knockout. So uh, Adam's postdoc uh, seen over here is his name is uh, Bertrand Coste. Is a very he was a very talented French postdoc in Adam's lab. So one chilly afternoon in December, Adam was sitting in his office and Coste came to Adam's office and said, Adam, I think we got it. Okay, so Adam, in one of his uh, talks after the Nobel Prize, he mentioned that this is probably the sweetest one line I have ever heard. And even this is even sweeter than the two o'clock, two o'clock morning, two o'clock call from the Swedish Academy. Okay, so what Coste means that meant that Adam, I think we have found the candidate which is responsible to measure which is responsible uh, for sensing pressure or touch. So what they did, they found, they predicted that there will be around 200, 200 candidates which might play a possible role 
in pain sensation. So they knocked them one at a time and they measured the current. As I've told you, these are all ion channels. So any change in this will alter the current flow. And the way they measured current was by a simple ammeter. And this is called a patch clamp experiment. Uh, I'm not going to go into details. So they knocked down one gene at a time. And they found that in their 72nd candidate, they couldn't measure the current. That means if you knock down this 72nd candidate the, and put pressure on the cell, the current is off. That means this gene or this protein was, in, was, was responsible for sensing pressure. And what it did in turn, it sensed pressure and it allowed ions to pass through it. So there's a close confirmation. And when it sensed mechanical force, it allowed calcium and sodium to pass through it. And again, and I'll just remind you, this ion goes and helps in neural transmission. And finally, the pain sensation or the touch sensation goes to the brain. Right. So this was the story of Arden Potapotion and Bartran Coast. They will not, we shouldn't uh, forget to mention the name of the postdoc because he did a huge amount of work uh, with Arden. And finally, they found the two receptors, PSO1 and PSO2, which are responsible for touch, touch sensation. And then they worked over the next many years to identify, to, to characterize the structure of this beautiful protein. As it turns out, this is a huge, huge membrane protein. It's not a small one, it's a huge membrane protein with 24 to 36 uh, uh, sequences which passes through the membrane. Okay, even, even if I don't explain it, I'm sure you can appreciate how difficult it's a protein to work with. So this is the cryo-electron microscope structure of PSO, PSO2, which is a pain sensor. And uh, this is the top view. And interestingly, over here, you can see it looks like a propeller of a helicopter or a fan, a blade of a fan. Okay, and the thing at the center over here, you can see a small hole. And this is the hole or this is the channel through which ions pass. Okay, so this is the structure of PHO1 as depicted by cryo-electron microscope microscopy. And this is the side view. I'm not going to go into the details. I'm just uh, want to emphasize that this is re a really complex protein, which is a huge size. You can see the number of uh, transmembrane uh, helix helices which passes through it. And this re red region is the region which forms the pore through which your uh, calcium and sodium passes and uh, results in the sensation of pain. On the top, is the propeller, which you just saw in the electron microscope structure. So this propeller uh, forms a selective selectivity, provides some selectivity to allow calcium and sodium to pass through it, but not other ions. Okay. And this is a side view. And when the membrane bends because of pressure, this channel opens and calcium and sodium gushes in. Okay. So this is uh, the, the, the short story of the discovery of the PHO1 and PHO2. Uh, and now they have been working on this and many, many other groups as well who was trained in Adam's lab. They have continued working on this and they're trying to understand are there any agonist or in, uh, antagonist chemicals which could be discovered which can block pain. Because if you can block these pain receptors in that specific part of the body, you can stop having pain. So this is the propeller structure uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the protein, which I'm not going to go into details. I'll just give you one simple example of how it works. One of the best example is migraine. So migraine attack, uh, I, I believe, I imagine some of you might have suffered from migraine and I, it's very unfortunate because although it's not very dangerous, but it can be innocuous. It can be innocuous, uh, and it's not, it's not that dangerous. But what happens, uh, so in your, uh, in your meninges, which is your covering of the brain, the, the thick coat that covers your brain, uh, 
you have blood vessels passing through it. And what happens because of changes in the blood pressure, uh, the, 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 the blood vessel swells. And sitting next to it are the nerves which are connected from the spinal cord to the brain. So these nerves contain this PSO1 and PSO2, PSO2 channels. So as, it, as, as the blood vessel swells, it brushes against the wall of the nerve. And this physical pressure opens up the channels, the PSO1 and the PSO2 channels, PSO2 channels. As soon as this opens, I told you calcium and sodium rushes in and you have the sensation of pain. But as soon as uh, the, the, the artery, uh, uh, the blood vessel goes back to its normal conformation, normal stage, this channel closes and the sensation of pain is gone. So edema, a swelling of brain, causes swelling of the blood vessels, which in turn causes opening of these pressure channels or pressure receptors on the nerve, and you have the sensation of pain. Uh, interestingly, uh, depending of what type of ions are entering your uh, entering through uh, the channels, or how many channels are there on that specific region will dictate how much pain do you have. It can vary from, I feel a little twinge now and then, to I just want to uh, sit here. Uh, and it can go up to say, uh, I can't talk, as shown by, uh, by a painting by, by Van Gogh. Picasso, something is very, very wrong with me. Even more extreme, I need morphine by Courbet. Munch says, ah, which I've just shown. And finally, I'm not even a human anymore. So this means all the channels are open and the ions are gushing in and you have a severe, severe sensation of pain. Fine. Okay. Uh, so is it all bad? Is it, is it really bad to have this uh, uh, mutations or this de is, is, is deficiencies or problems with these pressure receptors? No, it's not. There are very interesting cases where uh, in, in population in Africa, in, in specifically in the regions of Kenya, Tanzania, and uh, uh, the horns of Somalia, there are some indigenous population where the PSO1 gene has got a defect. I'm not going to discuss how, what is the defect and how it works, but just remember this PSO1 gene, which is responsible, which is responsible to, uh, to measure pressure uh, or feel pressure is, is, is defective. Okay, and PSO1 is present, or is present on the red blood cells of our blood, on RBC. Since they cannot feel the pressure, RBC or red blood cells doesn't know how much water to carry within itself. So it usually becomes shrunk, it shrinks. Okay, and since it shrinks, malaria parasite is unable to infect this RBC, right? And since malaria parasite is unable to infect this RBC, you don't suffer from cerebral malaria or e even simple malaria. But interestingly, these dehydrated RBC, they can normally carry oxygen. So these individuals, although they have, uh, they have a, uh, a protection against malaria because of this PSO1 problem, they don't have anemia. Or they, their, their, their RBC, their hemoglobin level is pretty close to normal. So in a way, in some sometimes, because of evolution and selection, uh, even mutations or, diff, or problems in these pressure, uh, pressure sensing channels can be a blessing. So this is a very interesting uh, case where, again, this study was done by Adem Potaputian's group where they have found that these populations, specifically in, in Africa, and some of them are in West Africa as well, they have a protection against malaria, and specifically cerebral malaria, because their pressure channels are not working. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears and talk about, a little bit about uh, the first, uh, individual whom, whose uh, photo I showed, his name is David Julius. 
So David Julius's uh, career was, was, was similar, but he started 10 years ago. He's 10 years uh, older to Adem. So David Julius started his career at, at, at the University of California, San Francisco, and now he is the chair professor of the department. So David Julius had a different type of problem. So David was trying to find out how we sense heat or cold. But the problem he faced, a big hurdle, that the cells that he was using, that we use in the lab on a regular basis, say uh, we use HeLa cells, you must have heard of the name, you cannot heat these cells up. I mean, you cannot put high temperature in these cells because your cells are going to die immediately. Okay, your cell membrane will be ruptured. So the problem he was facing was in, in his experimental planning or in his experimental technique where he cannot, where he couldn't heat these cells up because he was trying to identify heat sensors. So he was walking down and, and, and what happened? So he was constantly thinking about how can he solve this problem and start his experiments so that he can discover heat sensors in cells. So he has been thinking this, it has been rolling on the back of his mind continuously as, as it happens for all scientists. So he was walking down the aisle of a supermarket and he had sort of an epiphanic revelation where he thought that he was passing through uh, the aisle of the red chili peppers. He thought that when he eats chilies, he gets a sensation of burning. So the heat of chili is very similar to the heat of fire. And then he thought, if he drinks hot tea, and then he chews on a red chili pepper, the heat becomes more intense. And lo and behold, he started using the extract of chili pepper as a compensatory reagent for heat. So since he couldn't use heat, so he found a different way of using heat and that was a, a paste or a powder of red chili paper. Right, so he, he used that and again by uh, the knockdown screening which I, which I mentioned in, 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 in the last few slides, he discovered a gene, a protein which he called TRIP, T-R-P. Okay, so TRIP is, uh, well, he discovered the gene, but he found that earlier, long ago, uh, this protein has been all, already implicated in vision. It was first discovered in Drosophila, that means fruit flies, as a protein which is important for vision, and it's called transient receptor protein, T, transient receptor potential, TRP. And he found that this trip one, so it's a big, big, it's a big family of multiple trip proteins. So this trip one protein is responsible to sense the heat of chili peppers, and he called it trip one. And then he purified the chili peppers, and he found that a chemical called capsaicin, which uh, Shubhajit mentioned in his in his introduction, capsaicin was the active component of chili pepper. Which, which opened the trip channel and uh, let the ions in and that triggered the neuron, neuronal transduction and we could sense heat. And that was the same by which we could sense heat by fire and heat by capsaicin and a similar heat by wasabi or mustard the pungency. Okay, and then eventually he also discovered a protein called TRIP8, which again is a, is a member of the large TRIP family. So TRIP8 can sense menthol or cold, and it opens the ion channel, and the brain, the part of the brain which is responsible for cold reception get, gets lighted up. So this was the story, interesting story behind the discovery of heat and cold reception. So this is uh, a very simplistic 
uh, diagram of the trip channel, the trip one. This is uh, the heat channel, and you can see this is the region. And this 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 protein is much smaller as compared to piezo one or piezo two. So that was a much larger protein. This is pretty big, but it has only H transmembrane domains, and it is manageable. And these are the regions where your capsaicin comes and binds and opens the channel and allows the conduction or import of ions. And further uh, working on that, he discovered many more proteins, trip A1, trip V1, trip uh, M8, which I just mentioned, in different animals. And why was this important? Because you, 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 you might know that uh, there are animals which we call cold-blooded animals, like snakes or frogs. And there are animals like vampire bat who can sense heat or cold much, much better than we could do. So these animals were very interesting samples to understand physiology of heat and cold reception. For example, the rattlesnake has a trip A channel which can uh, measure heat of 28 degrees and beyond. Mouse can use a strip V1 to feel heat of 42 degrees and up. Okay, so these animal physiological studies were conducted in his lab and he deciphered the entire family of the trip channels. And now we know that there are around 13 channels which can measure temperature at different levels and they are found in different animals in the animal kingdom. So finally, uh, coming towards the end of the talk, I'll just wrap up. Trip V trip one uh, is the temperature uh, heat. It measures temperature heat pain. It, it, it maintains the core body temperature. It can also measure inflammatory pain. When we have fever, these channels become super active. It can measure neuropathic pain, visceral pain, and it's also very important for protective rest reflexes. So when you touch something hot, you immediately remove your hand from that hot surface. And this is very important to prevent further damage to your skin. On the other hand, touch reception or proprioception, which is nothing but a, a, a type of nociception, which I mentioned, measures mechanical stress. It's important. It's also present in your bladder, urinary bladder, which senses the urge of urination. If your bladder is full, you feel this, this feeling of full bladder is measured by piezo 2 and you feel going to the bathroom. It also measures blood pressure and it's also important for bone growth. So this is the final slide which, which shows the entire pathway of pain or heat or cold reception. Or pain in this case is, is your pain in the intestine. You had a bad food and you had a tummy ache which caused inflammation. This is uh, uh, received or this is perceived by the, uh, the the pain receptors and then it travels through the nerves goes through the nociceptors ends up at the spinal cord from the spinal cord it travels up and ends up in the, the thalamic pain sensation the region of the brain and you feel the pain and then you take the medicine and if this was cut completely off if something wrong went uh, went in this case, you will not feel the pain. And if you don't feel the pain, the damage will continue to happen in your intestine and it will go unnoticed till you die. So that's where the importance of pain and pressure receptors come into human physiology. Okay, so with that, uh, I'll, I'll slowly end my talk. So this is the Scripps Research Institute, one of the premier private research institutes in the US. It's not government funded. And this is a very good example where how the private research institutes can play a very important role in discovery. And let me tell you, they are not uh, uh, non-profit. They do profit a lot because they have spent so much money and effort on basic research that now they are discovering medicines and drugs and they are making huge profit. And on the other hand, UCSF is a very typical classical example of an academic institute, which is completely non-profit, non, uh, and uh, uh, it runs excellent basic science facilities and David Julius 
belongs to UCSF. With that, I will thank you and just I'll show you uh, two, two very interesting cartoon slides. Uh, the first one over here are the, uh, the membrane, uh, membrane proteins, the lochness in this, in this case. They are hunting for uh, cues. This might be the pain cue. It can be the pain signal. It can be the temperature signal. They're trying to catch them, and they will transmit it to the next uh, partner of neural transduction. And on this case, uh, this is a personal agony, which I'm going to share with you. It's very difficult to work with membrane proteins, but it's very challenging. But at the end of the day, it's very satisfying. OK. So this uh, is a multi multi membrane spanning proteins, lockness. This lockness says, congrats, congrats. Uh, uh, so pretty and not too expensive. So she has just one transmembrane domain, so it's not that expensive. But this is very expensive because it has got so many. And it's difficult to work with, but it's very exciting. So with that, thank you so much. Uh, thanks. I'll end my talk over here. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for such an enlightening uh, talk. Uh, it was wonderful to hear from you. So now the floor is open for the audience. Uh, you may post your questions and doubts in the chat box. And uh, I would like to request the audience watching us from YouTube live uh, now can also post their questions in the live chat. If possible, then uh, we would like to address them one by one yeah so shine or, or, or one more thing uh, before you proceed Shubhajit. uh yeah. so yeah I'll, I'll be answering questions obviously and and i would love to do that but if there are uh, uh, something more in details you would like to know please email me and i i believe you all you all of you have my icer email address so i'll be more than happy to answer them over email as well Okay, so thanks a lot, sir. So I would like to request Shayantan if you, uh, if he has to add anything more to it. I would like to hand him over. Yeah, thanks a lot, Shubhajit. First of all, uh, you know, like, uh, we would like to convey uh, our heartfelt vote of thanks to today's speaker, our respected sir, Dr. Gupta, for his kind time and consideration in his amazing talk. Uh, thanks to today's host, uh, Shubhajit, who managed to anchor things readily with a perpetual flow. And, you know, like, this is the time for like shooting questions like it's all, all always engaging when you guys like engage in, in something which is creative and when it's uh, of course like this is the Nobel talk series episode two so I guess it, it is a bit I mean very much interesting and, and engaging for you all guys and uh, thanks a lot for joining and uh, you can you can ask your questions in the chat box directly so uh, first of all Aditya just asked one question we have the first question of the day here what use does an unlikely element like copper have in the TRP and PISO receptors? So uh, I'd like to, uh, I mean, direct this question oh, yeah, directly yeah. to sir. Yeah. No, no, no. Copper doesn't have any role in PRIP or PISO receptor. It doesn't. So I just gave you an example of a copper channel because uh, I had a ready slide in my computer and we work on that. And it's an iron channel. So I thought putting as, as an example so that I can show you a real research slide and give you an example where... Uh, how uh, or where these ion channels are located. Okay, so copper doesn't have a role in trip or pH receptor. Okay, but it, it is a very similar, uh, uh, the, the copper channels, they are very similar to trip and pH receptors because they are also ion channels. Okay, should I go to the next question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. Uh, Srinivas Adi Reddick, sir, can you give us an idea on how the influx of the ion sends the signal to the brain? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. Uh, well, what it does, uh, these ion channels, uh, uh, these ions, specifically calcium, and to a certain extent sodium and potassium, they help in fusion of vesicles which carry the neurotransmitters with the synaptic membrane. So synapse is the region where the cell dumps it neuro, its neurotransmitter, which can be taken up for the next cell and which can be dumped at the synaptic uh, cleft, which can be again next taken up by the next cell. So it's like a relay. So this relay of a signal, which passes from one nerve to the next nerve and to the next nerve and finally to the brain, this is controlled by these calcium ions because 
let me repeat it helps in fusion of the of the vesicles or the bodies which carries these neurotransmitters okay i Does guess the question is answered yeah so you guys can also speak up if you require like uh, uh, i guess sir it will be of no issues if they can speak uh, and yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah absolutely. because we so just we want would, more yeah. interaction yeah sure. yeah we would request you people to uh, unmute yourself and ask the question that would be interactive yes yeah sir and uh, you can now go to the third slide i mean okay. sorry third question. question yeah sorry yeah uh, well that's a very <laughs> Interesting question. Ujwal asked me, what about the Himalayan monks or people who live in extreme climate? How do the pain heat receptor work for them? Well, since we are mammals, uh, we do maintain a constant body temperature. Okay. And uh, uh, about the monks, uh, I am not sure I am equipped well enough to answer that question. But yes, when you, when, you, when you go to higher elevation or when you move to a colder climate or when you're walking down the snow, you can feel the the temperature, the the, the freezing temperature, and that's how you, that's what, when you have to act accordingly. You have to wear a sweater or you have to wear a cap. Okay, so this uh, this this discovery was about elucidation of how we sense temperature. May it be cold or hot. Okay, but coming to your question about Himalayan monks, uh, I I am not sure I can answer that. Okay. Okay, so the next question is by Odrija. In the slides regarding heat receptors, there were mentions of apparent threshold temperature for these receptors, above or below which they get deactivated. How were these threshold temperatures determined? Oh, that's a very good question. So these threshold uh, uh, temperatures were actually not determined in experiments. Okay, they were determined on the basis of the animals or the, the, the species in which they are expressed. For example, a snake, the temperature of the body temperature of a snake, a normal body temperature, just like ours is 37 degrees. For a snake, it's 20 degree, 28 degrees. So anything beyond that, the, the, uh, uh, the channels get activated. So let me, let me reiterate, it's not experimentally that they have done, it's usually done on the basis of the physiology of the animal itself. I guess that that sort of satisfies Odrija. So Shomana is asking, can you give some overview of the mechanism of how different trip channels get activated at separate temp specific temperatures? Yes, absolutely. So this is still an ongoing study where people are trying to understand how uh, these channels are differentially activated by different temperatures. So what we keep on forgetting that these protein ion channels are just not they don't just work by themselves, right? There is a lipid bilayer which surrounds these channels in which these channels are embedded. So there is an important role of the lipid species also, which on which these channels are embedded. If it's phosphatidylserine or phosphatidylcholine or the, the amount of cholesterol which is present in this lipid bilayer, which plays a very important role in the activity of these channels. Number one. Number two, the number of cysteines, the protein, the, the amino acid cysteine, which are present in different regions of these channels, they also dictate it to, to a certain extent that at what temperature they will be active. But let me tell you, this is an ongoing work and I have been trying to find the answer to it, but there are only partial answers. So we have to, I guess we have to wait a little while or you guys have to answer it when you do your own research. Okay. Uh, Sai Sunil, how does the nociceptor determine that a particular stimulus is of pain? Right. So as I told you, these nociceptors, they are selective for calcium or sodium or potassium. And also the amount they're letting it in. So for a little pain, you have little calcium coming in. For severe pain, there is huge amount of calcium influx. Okay, so the amount of ions which is entering and also what type of ion it is, but primarily it's the amount of ion influx that dictates the severity of pain. Because that dictates how quick the, the, the signal will be carried by the nerves through the spinal cord to the thalamus. 
Okay, so it's the amount of pressure or the heat will dictate how much calcium will go in, and that will in turn dictate the intensity of the pain. Certain people, so Srinivas has said thank you, thank, thank you so much as well. So Aditya is asking, certain people have inborn mutations in these receptors. What procedures or steps do they take to live their lives? Well, these mutations are not that common. So uh, you will not find uh, too many people with these mutations, but uh, there has been a search for medicines and drugs which can act as agon uh, antagonist for, this, for these channels. But unfortunately, Agonists has been found, but not antagonist. So Scripps Research Institute is spending a lot of effort and money to discover these small molecules which can act as antagonists for these receptors. But let me tell you, there's a problem with this as well. So these receptors are expressed sort of in all tissues. So if you take an antagonist, that will block your reception of pain for all for the entire body. And that's the problem. So you have to have selectivity or topical selectivity. So that is still something which scientists are working and trying to understand. Okay, so it's an ongoing process. How do different ions like calcium or sodium convey different messages during this is again Aditya? How do different ions like calcium or sodium convey different messages during? pain reception for the nose receptors, are these receptors different for different ions? Yes, yes, there are uh, uh, subtypes of these channels. But uh, for example, for piezo-1, it is a non-specific channel. It allows calcium as well as sodium, but calcium to a much higher extent. But if you ask me about the selectivity, we don't know. Again, that's the ongoing study. And hopefully, we have to wait a little bit to understand about the selectivity of these channels okay any more questions we do right in the last slide so he was is asking in in the last slide i couldn't listen properly you talked about multiple ion channels connected can you explain about no i, I didn't say that they were connected but what i what i mentioned was there are multiple channels at different locations of your body and they are responsible to finally to connect everything through the central nervous system so that was more of a uh, what to say unifying slide for the entire talk deep to what's the relevance of the geometry of pain receptor in sensing the change in its mechan uh, mechano environment, geometry of the pain receptor. Right, right. That's a good question. So geometry of the pain receptor. Right. So the geometry, if you if you mean by geometry, you mean by the structure, the conformation. So pain receptors are usually very large proteins. Why? Because these pain receptors can sense membrane bending. If it's a very small protein, it will not be able to sense bending of a membrane. It has to be a large protein. To You can see my camera, I believe. You can see me. So this is a membrane. If it's a very small protein, if, if the membrane bends, you will not be able to, uh, uh, to, to, to find out whether the membrane is bending or not. But if it's a large protein, with the bending of the membrane, the protein will also bend. Okay, And this bending will allow the opening of the, the ion channels. Okay, so geometry is very important in this case. Okay, so I guess this is, there are no more questions. Uh, I would, okay, so there's one more. Uh, I have to rush a little bit because I have a talk at 7.30. Uh, so is ca in cancer, does the increase in cell causes the activation of piezo receptor? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, if, if you see the recent uh, paper in 2020 uh, from Ardem's lab, so they have tried to understand uh, what's the role of piezo receptors in cell cell uh, contact. Okay. And they, if I'm not wrong, they have discovered that the piezo receptors on cancer cells are much more in number as compared to normal cells. But I, I don't have the exact data, or I don't remember it exactly, but I would ask you to refer to one of his recent uh, articles in Cell in 2020. But I think that's a very good question, and I also need to look into it.
okay so yeah sir i guess there are no questions no more questions so yeah if if you know like there is no like we can proceed to the conclusion and once again like uh, our heartfelt vote of thanks to today's speaker like dr gupta for his time and consideration and for his you know like for his um, agreement in our in our request in keeping our request and for like we owe our gratitude to ronak mojumdar like who helped us stream the whole thing on behalf of the isa kolkata campus video team and last but not the least thanks to thanks a lot to all the audience members for joining so i guess we can wrap it up and we can stop the recording as well so thank you thanks uh, the science club and it was really a big pleasure for me and uh, i hope you enjoyed it so thanks from my side it's a privilege thank you so much thanks a lot sir thanks a lot okay guys thanks a lot for participating in the event